He has been called, and these are all terms that come from national newspapers, a bomb thrower, a McCarthyite, a naysayer, a nitpicker, and a prime illustration of what plagues the Republican Party. And he's been in office for two months. <laughs> Today on Uncommon Knowledge, the junior senator from Texas, Ted Cruz. From Washington, D.C., Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, now appearing on the website of the Wall Street Journal. I'm Peter Robinson. Rafael Edward Cruz graduated from Princeton University and Harvard Law School. During the administration of George W. Bush, he served at the Federal Trade Commission and at the Department of Justice. In 2003, he went home to Texas to serve as Solicitor General, a position he held for five years and during which he himself appeared before the Supreme Court of the United States nine times. In July of last year, Mr. Cruz defeated Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst for the Republican senatorial nomination, and in the general election in November, he defeated his Democratic opponent by 15 points. Senator Cruz, welcome. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be with you, and thank you to everyone at Hoover for hosting uh, this as well. I'm, I'm honored to be here. As I mentioned, you mounted a primary challenge to David Dewhurst. Listen to David Dewhurst's positions. Pro-life, opposed to gay marriage, helped to enact one of the biggest tax cuts in Texas history, and if elected to the Senate, he promised, he would repeal Obamacare, balance the federal budget, secure the border, and slash, that was his word, slash the federal government. David Dewhurst was not conservative enough for you. How come? You know, I, I think we're at an extraordinary time right now in this country. I, I think the challenges we're facing are qualitatively different from challenges we faced before. We are facing economic and fiscal challenges. Our national debt is larger than our entire economy. And the unhappy truth is that a big part of how that happened was career politicians in both parties. I think one of the best things to happen to the Republican Party was to get our teeth kicked in in 2008. Uh, because an awful lot of Republicans, I think, had gone along to get along with Democrats in exploding the size, power, and spending of the federal government. And I think the biggest divide is not even a divide between Republicans and Democrats. It's a divide between the people and the entrenched elites in Washington that are growing their own power. And, and I think there is an incredible desire to get back to common sense conservative principles, living within your means, living within the Constitution. And that was ultimately what was the fuel behind our campaign, was the desire to have someone stand up and, and defend those common sense principles. And you communicated to the people of Texas a temperamental difference you said, in effect, I'm going to go to Washington to shake things up. I'm a fighter. Is that correct? I, I think that's certainly right. I mean, the, my, my campaign focused on a proven conservative record that over and over again, when I was serving as the Solicitor General of Texas, I had had the opportunity, serving under Greg Abbott, the Attorney General, to stand up and fight for conservative principles on a national level and, and to win. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of conservatives are tired of leaders in Washington who don't know what they believe and can't effectively stand up and defend them. And I, and, and I think that needs to change. All right, your two months in this town. The New York Times headline, the GOP's nasty newcomer. Now, a Texan could take or leave the New York Times, but one of your colleagues, Lindsey Graham, fellow Republican, fellow conservative, a man who's served in the Senate for almost a decade now, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina had this to say about you, quote, you're going to be respected if you can throw a punch, but you also have to prove you can do a deal, close quote. Senator, two months, you have gotten even Lindsey Graham's nose out of joint. What are you up to? <laughs> you know, the two months I've been here, I've been doing my job. I've been doing what I think the citizens of Texas elected me to do, which is go and stand for conservative principles. And I have to admit, the fact that the New York Times is this hysterical so quickly uh, <laughs> may suggest that maybe we're doing the right thing. Listen, a lot of this uh, hysteria arises from a single moment. 
which is during the uh, Chuck Hagel, Senate, former Senator Chuck Hagel's confirmation hearing to be Secretary of Defense. Now, let me set this up uh, because this is an important question. And, and there is one charge that really you, have to, you almost have to answer, would be my judgment. This is you during the hearing, quote, he, this is you talking about Chuck Hagel's refusal to detail the sources of income from while he was in the private sector. He, Chuck Hagel, this is you, he could not even say that the 200,000 he received for speeches and appearances did not come directly from a foreign government. It is at a minimum relevant to know if that $200,000 came directly from Saudi Arabia, came directly from North Korea, close quote. Senator Claire McCaskill immediately said, we had a terrible experience when Joe McCarthy hung out in the United States Senate, MSNBC's Chris Matthews, I watched Cruz in those hearings and I saw Joe McCarthy, close quote. Okay, uh, so explain the point you were making in that hearing and then let us know if you regret anything at all about the way you made the point. Well, I think there were three substantive issues mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that were at point, and it's, wor it's worth underscoring, my focus on Hegel consistently and my focus on hearings on guns and my focus on everything else consistently remains on the record and the substance. On Hegel, you had number one, his substantive foreign policy record, then you had his personal financial disclosures, and then you had the question of whether and to what extent he had received indirectly funding from foreign sources. Now on all of those, I mean I began the questioning of Hegel and repeatedly have praised his personal character, uh, his service and sacrifice, volunteering to fight for this country. Uh, none of that has ever been in question. What's been in question is his substantive record. And in my view, his substantive foreign policy record is extreme. Uh, it is, during his time in the Senate, he was consistently the most antagonistic senator to the nation of Israel. He consistently opposed sanctions or any form of credible military deterrence to the nation of Iran. He opposed designating Hamas, Hezbollah, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard as terrorist organizations. Now, those are extreme views. I mean, that's why the Washington Post characterized his record as, quote, near the fringe of the U.S. Senate. Uh, those are also views that, in my judgment, if he is confirmed, will only encourage the nation of Iran to accelerate its efforts to develop a nuclear weapon, which I think sadly makes the chance of military conflict more likely and not less likely. And I would like to avoid seeing our sons and daughters sent into harm's way, and I think encouraging Iran to develop nuclear weapons, which this confirmation would do, is, is the wrong path. Mm -hmm. So my focus has consistently been on his substantive record. Now the second set of it is financial disclosures. Right. As a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, I, along with 24 other senators, requested that Chuck Hagel provide additional financial disclosure. And in particular, we requested two things. Number one, we asked him to disclose what personal compensation he's received over the last five years in excess of $5,000. And number two, he had disclosed a number of different private firms that had paid him substantial sums of money. We asked of those firms, to what extent did they receive that funding from foreign nations, foreign mm -hmm. uh, lobbyists, foreign corporations? Both, I think, very, very reasonable sets of questions. Both questions that have been asked before. For example, Hillary Clinton, when she was nominated to be Secretary of State, she voluntarily disclosed eight years of prior compensation. Yet somehow the New York Times says it is objectively unreasonable for 25 senators to ask for five years from Chuck Hagel. His response to this request from 25 senators was to, to tell, tell them essentially go jump in a lake. He simply said no. He said, my personal compensation, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's in his complete control. He has it at his fingertips. He can hand it over and he simply said no. I refuse to tell you what money I've been paid. And with respect to the private firms that had paid him funds. There were seven that we asked about. Six, he said, that he could represent the money they paid him was not, and this is his term, quote, foreign derived. Mm -hmm. The seventh, he couldn't even make that representation. So the point I was making that you asked this about is, is, serious, right? is under your own language, you said seven, six of them didn't pay you foreign derived funds, which means the seventh one, if you're not willing to say that, it leads to the obvious inference 
that it may well have been foreign derived. Now, as I said in that very same hearing, and none of the people attacking me play this, I say, look, it may be perfectly appropriate to have indirectly got foreign funds. If, if the nation of Canada had invested some money and you were doing timber deals, I don't think that would raise any concerns from a national security perspective. But the point was, it is at a minimum relevant to know whether the Secretary of Defense has received indirectly substantial sums from foreign governments. Now, the response to all of this has not been to debate Hegel's record, and it's not been to provide any of that financial disclosure. Instead, it has been a cacophony uh, of criticisms directed at me. And, and look, that's fine. That, that's Washington. Um, I've got thick skin. You asked, is there anything I regret? What I do regret is that they were successful in their strategy of changing the topic. Mm. They didn't want to talk about Chuck Hagel's substantive foreign policy record because it's extreme and dangerous. And they didn't want to talk about his refusal to provide basic financial disclosure because I think it is very difficult to defend on the merits. So instead, they started banning about personal charges and, and their favorite is, is McCarthyist right. for asking someone to disclose the money they've been paid before they serve as the chief civilian leader of our US military. I, I think it was designed to distract and unfortunately it had some success in distracting. Did it teach you anything about the way Washington works? <coughs> Did you get hit by hammers that you didn't know were there? Oh, you know, I, I think the New York Times thinks they have a hammer. Uh, they have more of a daffodil. All right. Uh, I, <laughs> that's, that's him trying to make up. Uh, you know, ironically <laughs> enough, uh, you know, they, they seem to believe that, that criticism in the New York Times somehow hurts you back in Texas. The New York... <laughs> If the New York Times really wanted to do damage, they would start praising me every day. That would get Texans going, what the heck are you doing wrong? But I have to tell you, yeah, Peter, actually, sure. the, the most probably surreal criticism uh, has been from Cher. Cher. Uh, Cher has begun tweeting uh, excessively about me. I have to tell you. Um, what would be appropriate tweeting about you from Cher? <laughs> I, I, I would say none whatsoever. None whatsoever. <laughs> right. uh, but, but she has begun attacking me in, in very personal ways on, on Twitter. And I have to say, number one, I, I surely never thought uh, that Cher would be saying anything about me. Uh, and, and number two, I have to admit, this is the first time ever I, I've been called a gypsy tramp or thief. <laughs> uh, and, and for the fact checkers out there, that was a joke. She did not, in fact, call me that, because surely PolitiFact will say that joke was not, not based in fact. One of the, a quick way of summarizing your own positions is to tick through a couple of the measures that you've already had the opportunity to vote against. You were one of 34 senators who voted against raising the debt ceiling. How come? Because the proposal that raised the debt ceiling didn't cut any spending at all. Look, what we're doing in this country, I think is fundamentally immoral. I mean, we're saddling our kids and our grandkids with crushing debt. And the Senate, I think it is far more remarkable that 60 plus Senators voted to, voted to raise the debt ceiling without cutting a penny of spending. You numbered among just three senators to vote against the confirmation of John Kerry as Secretary of State. How come on that one? I think John Kerry's record, uh, in particular, he has repeatedly supported international organizations, international treaties that I think have undermined U.S. sovereignty. And so I couldn't in good conscience vote for him. And, and in fact, the standard I applied to him was, was the John Kerry standard. It was the same standard John Kerry applied when he voted against Condoleezza Rice. It was the same standard John Kerry applied when he voted against Alberto Gonzalez. It was the same standard he applied when he voted against Michael Mukasey. And, and that's fine. Uh, I will point out that there was a difference. Kerry's views are very much on the left. There was a difference between voting against John Kerry and Chuck Hagel's views, which are qualitatively different from where John Kerry's record has been. Chuck Hagel's views, particularly in the de Defense Department, in my judgment, led to the necessity for far greater scrutiny in terms of his past substantive foreign policy record. 
uh, you were one of 36 senators who opposed a relief package for the region struck by Hurricane Sandy. And on this one, if you would, imagine explaining yourself to New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. Well, I'm sure that would be a lively conversation. <laughs> I, you know, the, the Sandy relief package was a perfect example of what's wrong with Washington. Uh, just about everyone in Washington agrees that we should have relief for an area that was struck with a, a tragic storm. What happened is you had a bunch of politicians that just put tons of pork, billions and billions of dollars of spending on that package that had nothing to do with Sandy. Substantial amounts of money in that package weren't being spent in the Northeast where Sandy was hit, and they were being spent as much as a decade from now. Now, spending a decade from now you know, my dictionary at least doesn't call that emergency relief spending. Uh, and it became a Christmas tree. It became a Christmas tree for ev every politician that wanted to get his or her pork spending into the bill. We, we had an amendment that I supported that, that would have offset that spending with spending cuts. And the problem is, in Washington, there's a bipartisan opposition to actually constraining the growth of spending. And I think that's dangerous. And it goes back to what I talked about before. You know, if you get outside of the Beltway, if you actually go to America, it is not an extreme position to want to live within your means. It is not an extreme position to not want to bankrupt the country. And, and those views are shared. They're not just shared by Republicans. They're shared by independents and Democrats. You know, most of us, if, if we ran our lives or our businesses the way the federal government is run, we'd be bankrupt. We'd be sleeping under a bridge. Uh, listen to this list. Ted Cruz of Texas, Rand Paul of Kentucky, Marco Rubio of Florida, Patrick Toomey of Pennsylvania, Jeff Flake of Arizona, Mike Lee of Utah, Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, Tim Scott of South Carolina, all, rel all relatively new to the Senate, all thoroughly conservative. Uh, Chris Chokel, a president of the Club for Growth, remarked recently, that you and your young cohort have begun re redefining what it means to be a Republican in the Senate. And so I ask you, two months into this job, is it the case that you actually have designs on the institution itself, and what should it mean to be a Republican in the United States Senate? Well, I think Republicans need to get back to our core principles. It's not a question of, of redesigning what it means to be a Republican. It's a question of rediscovering it. Uh, getting back to common sense conservative principles, getting back to the principles that, that Ronald Reagan embraced so thoroughly. Ronald who? <laughs> <laughs> you know, sadly, there are a lot of people in the Senate who say that same thing. Uh, and we have a great strength. Our policies How did you work. become conservative? How did this happen? You're a young man. <laughs> Here you emerge fully formed when a lot of people are still trying to figure things out. How did this happen? Well, a, a, a big part of, of who I am is my family story. Uh, my dad's from Cuba. Uh, he fought in the revolution when he was a teenager. He was imprisoned and tortured by Batista's government. Uh, he was beaten almost to death. And, and he fled Cuba in 1957 came to Texas when he was 18 years old, couldn't speak English, washed dishes, making 50 cents an hour to pay his way through college, went on to start a small business. Some time ago, my, my wife Heidi and I were having dinner with some friends and, the, and they asked, they said, you know, when did you first get interested in politics? Mm -hmm. And I scratched my head, I said, you know, I don't really remember when I was and I'm not sure why. And Heidi begins laughing. And, and you know how sometimes or often your spouse will see things that are blazingly obvious and yet you're too obtuse to notice them yourself. And she looks at me and says, well, no wonder. Think of the family you were raised in. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, it is an enormous blessing to be the child of an immigrant who fled oppression. Because at our dinner table, when I was two, three, four, five years old, <coughs> there was an urgency to politics. That there was, it wasn't just pick up the paper, oh, that's interesting, this is what's happening principled men and women in office is what keeps us from tyranny. It was not a game. It, it, it mattered. It mattered. It, when you've seen liberty taken away, you realize how precious and fragile it is. As, as Reagan famously said, it's not something passed down in the bloodstream. 
every generation has to step up and defend our liberty. And that, ever since I was a child, what, what I wanted and hoped to do was to, to defend free market principles, to defend the Constitution, the principles that have led to this being the greatest nation on the history of the earth and presenting the greatest opportunity of any nation on earth. Senator Ted Cruz quoted in National Review, quote, statists have talented people drawn to politics because they believe in power. But for conservatives, there has always been an incredible scarcity of effective, principled defenders of liberty. Close quote. Why is that the case? You're suggesting that there's almost a structural advantage. I look, on the left, if you're a child of the left, you go into politics, you go into media, you go into entertainment. The left controls the avenues of the communication of ideas, of culture. Uh, Barack Obama is the epitome of the ideal leftist. On the right, you look at most of the young, talented conservatives. What do they do? They go make money. They go into the private sector. They go start a business. They go work productively making widgets. And, you know, you got to have a screw loose, it seems, to want to go into politics. I can't tell you how many conservatives have said, you know, who in their right mind would jump into this business where two months into the job, you're getting attacked by Cher? <laughs> And that, over time, uh, I, I think has, conservatives often underestimate the power and transmission of ideas. Cruz, this is George Will now on you. Cruz believes the reaction against Barack Obama will give the Republican Party a cadre who take their bearings from constitutional law as it was before the New Deal judicial revolution, close quote. So do you feel that even as, somewhere I saw that you said that it took Jimmy Carter to give us Ronald Reagan, is Barack Obama, there's a long list that we can mourn about the, real, the election and re-election of Barack Obama, but you see Barack Obama calling forth a determined cadre of opponents. You yes. hope it or you see it? I, both. Um, and, and listen, let me start by saying something that, that would surprise um, some of the detractors. I respect Barack Obama. You want to repeat that, please? I, I, I respect Barack Obama. I think he is deeply principled, and I think he's been tremendously effective advancing his principles. I actually have many times disagreed with some conservative critics who, who paint him in disparaging terms. I think this is a man who believes in all of his heart in government control of the economy, and our day-to-day -day lives, who is working on a daily basis to transform this country. He's a principled man, a he's, principled he's and a talented deeply man. deeply principled, and he's also willing to sacrifice for those principles. If you rewind the clock to 2009, 2010, it was abundantly obvious with Obamacare. When Obamacare was being pushed, we had gubernatorial elections in Virginia and New Jersey, both of which had been blue, both of which became red. And then we saw a national referendum effectively on Obamacare with Ted Kennedy's former seat in Massachusetts where the People's Republic of Massachusetts elected a Republican. At that point, I think there is no doubt, had Bill Clinton been president, he would have said abandon ship. He would have done the, the pragmatic decision of we're going to get killed, we the Democrats pushing Obamacare, Let's stop doing it. And I actually respect that I think President Obama knew there would be an incredible price to be paid at the polls for forcing Obamacare down the voters' throats despite their strong opposition to it. And he believes in his principles. And, and when he ran, he said his objective was to, to, to lead the fundamental transformation of this country. He meant it. He meant it. And, and I take him at his word and I respect him for being committed to his principles. Now, I also think those principles are profoundly dangerous. They don't work. But I have no doubt that President Obama uh, sleeps at peace every night, that he believes he is improving the country, he is making things better. Uh, the problem is, I just think he's sorely mistaken. An article entitled, that's in the current issue of Commentary Magazine, How to Save the Republican Party, this is by former George W. Bush staffers Michael Gerson and Pete Weiner. 
quote, a new Republican agenda requires the party to welcome rising immigrant groups. The GOP has taken an issue of genuine concern, namely the lack of border security, and spoken about it in ways offensive to vast numbers of Hispanics and Asian Americans, close quote. And I note that you got 35% of the Hispanic vote in Texas, which is a percent less than John Cornyn received when he ran in 2008, and he ain't Cuban. Well, so although, how, although actually that polling was from a source that did it beforehand, and those, those numbers are a little suspect. So, all right. Uh, all right. You know, what I can tell you is two things. Number one, there is no doubt, as Republicans, we got to do a better job in the Hispanic community. Uh, and if we don't, the Republican Party will not remain a national party for long. Period. Period. Let me also say, though, that, that I think the media wants to focus this attention entirely on immigration. And, and immigration is important, and I'm happy to, to, to talk about it. And there is no doubt that, that Republicans' tone on immigration has been less than productive. Uh, people aren't going to vote for you if they think you don't like them. Self-deportation would not be the theme of the day? In I, but but let, let me tell you something that I think is, is far more important. So, so we've done extensive polling of the Hispanic community in Texas to figure out, all right, what are the values, what are the issues that matter to them? We asked Hispanic voters in Texas to name their number one issue. You know what percentage named immigration as their number one issue? No idea. 5%. 54% of Hispanic voters in Texas said their number one issue was jobs and the economy. And in my view, the reason we got clobbered in the last election across the board, and in particular that we got clobbered among Hispanics, among young people, comes down to two words, 47%. Now, now let me be clear what I mean by that. I don't mean the comment itself. I, I don't mean that ill-fated comment. Anybody who, if you stick a TV camera in someone's face 24 hours a day, seven days a week, anyone will make an ill-advised comment. And, and I think Mitt Romney is, is a good and decent man who worked very, very hard on his campaign. But what I mean when I say 47% is why we lost is the narrative of the last election. The overall narrative of the last election was the 47% who are dependent on government, we don't have to worry about them. And I gotta tell you, as a conservative, I can't think of an idea more antithetical to what it is we believe, for one thing, it buys into the liberal notion that the economic pie is fixed, that it's static, that th that 47% today is the same that it will be tomorrow and the next day. And you know, if that premise is right, if the economic pie never changes, then the central liberal argument for redistributing wealth has a lot of force to it. If the pie is never changing, it's very hard to justify why some should enjoy so much while others have so little. Now, what we understand is the premise is deeply flawed, that it is a dynamic and growing pie. And in fact, that the free market system we have in this country has produced greater prosperity, greater opportunity than any economic system in the history of the world. I think we should be the party, Republicans should be the party of the 47% of those climbing the economic ladder. And I think we did a horrible, horrible job of, of laying that out and of winning that argument. One more quotation from this article, How to Save the Republican Party. Quote, Republicans oppose same-sex marriage out of deference to traditional family structures, but among the largest portion of a rising generation, this appears to be a losing battle, close quote. So the social issues, gay marriage, abortion, uh, the GOP is just on the wrong side of history. You know, if it were up to the media, uh, that would have been the case a long, long time ago. I, uh, uh, my, my view is very much like, like Mark Twain's. Uh, rumors of the death of conservatives, I think, are greatly, uh, greatly exaggerated. What I will tell you, though, I think the existential threat facing this country right now is the out-of-control spending and deficits and debt that are threatening the future of our kids and grandkids. And so I have spent a great deal of time talking about what I call opportunity conservatism, which is that conservatives should conceptualize and articulate every domestic policy 
with a laser focus on easing the means of ascent up the economic ladder, that we should view policy through a Rawlsian lens. How does it impact those who are least well off among us? And what we have done a terrible job of doing is explaining that the policies of the left do not work and they systematically hurt those at the bottom of the economic ladder. Let me give you an example, Peter. We just recently saw the State of the Union address, mm -hmm. which was an, instead of reaching out for bipartisan cooperation on pro-growth policies, which I hoped he might do, it was unabashed liberalism. It embraced things like cap and trade, like more Obamacare, like raising the minimum wage. And you know, my reaction on, on hearing all of that is every one of those policies, if those were implemented, they would make it harder for young people coming out of school to find their first job. They would make it harder for Hispanics and African Americans struggling to climb the economic ladder to reach towards success. They would make it harder for everyone working towards the American dream to achieve that. Let me give a specific example. Let's take the minimum wage. If President Obama gets what he wants, he jacks up the minimum wage to $9, we know a couple of things will happen and they're absolute incontrovertible. Number one, youth unemployment will go up. Number two, African-American unemployment will go up and Hispanic unemployment will go up. When my dad, 55 years ago, was an 18-year-old kid washing dishes, he got that job because he couldn't speak English and you didn't have to speak English to wash dishes. He was paid 50 cents an hour. If President Obama had had his way, if the minimum wage had been $2 instead of 50 cents an hour, my dad never could have gotten that job. And if he hadn't gotten that job, he couldn't have paid his way through school. He couldn't have eventually gone on to start a small business. These policies of the Obama administration, they don't work. And the people they hurt the most are young people, African-American, Hispanic, single women, those struggling to achieve the American dream. And as conservatives, we have got to learn to understand that and to explain that. Senator, last question. <clears throat> As you know, there's a great deal of talk about the need for the Republican Party to reinvent itself. Ronald Reagan left office a quarter of a century ago. And listen to what a profile in Mother Jones said about you. Another, <laughs> uh, another popular publication back home in Texas, I'm sure. Quote, for all the talk of Cruz as the GOP candidate of the future, there's something anachronistic in what he's selling. Close quote. So now here's what's going to happen. I'm going to play a very brief clip, but it's a very old clip. And I'd like you to listen to that clip and then tell us how you believe the Republican Party should just get past it. Not too long ago, two friends of mine were talking to a Cuban refugee, a businessman who had escaped from Castro. And in the midst of his story, one of my friends turned to the other and said, we don't know how lucky we are. And the Cuban stopped and said, how lucky you are. I had some place to escape to. And in that sentence, he told us the entire story. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. So, Senator, how do we just get over that? The problem is we did get over that for a while and we don't and we shouldn't. If they think it's anachronistic to look back to Reagan, I look back a lot longer than that. I look back to the Constitution, I look back to the Declaration, I look back to basic principles of human freedom. I'll tell you, President Reagan there telling that story, when I was a kid, my dad said to me over and over and over again, when we faced oppression in Cuba, I had a place to flee to. If we lose our freedom here, where do we go? I mean, that is, the American experience, all of us, every one of us, we are the children and grandchildren of those who fled oppression and came here seeking freedom. And you know, I have to tell you, just a few weeks ago, when I rested my hand upon the Bible to take the oath of office, I couldn't help but think back to 55 years earlier, to my dad as an 18-year-old kid unable to speak English washing dishes. If someone had told that young immigrant 55 years hence, your son will be sworn in as a United States Senator representing the great state of Texas. That would have been utterly unimaginable. It would have been beyond anything he could reasonably have conceived. And yet, 
There was my father sitting in the gallery looking down as I took the oath of office. And, and that, Peter, I gotta tell you, in, in my life and my family, that was, that was a powerful, powerful moment. But it's a very small example of the incredible opportunity this country provides. There is a reason millions of people from all over the world have risked everything to come here because no other country on earth has provided the opportunity for so many to start with nothing and achieve anything. That's what we've got to get back. The economic mobility that lets people start with nothing and achieve the American dream, that's what's being jeopardized and that's what I think we as conservatives need to defend every single day. Ted Cruz, junior senator from Texas, thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson.